Last week, we looked at how the Disney company was changing at the start of 2022, with one exception, the Genie Plus service, which is the replacement for Fast Pass Plus. This is also the single largest change to the American parks this year. I've waited until after the winter holidays so I could see how well the system worked during peak visitation periods before reporting on it. As with Fast Pass Plus, there are some useful strategies that you can use to optimize this system. I have some thoughts about when, if, and at what parks you should use the paid portions of this system. We'll look at both the California parks and the Florida parks. By the end of today's episode, hopefully, you will not only understand what these systems are trying to accomplish, but more importantly, you will understand how to leverage your knowledge of them to your advantage next time you're in the parks. So we have a bit of history, some wonky speculation, a dash of industrial engineering, and practical use guides to optimize the system. So if you're ready, here we go. Let's start with the story to explore how this system is being integrated into the overall parks experience. Back in October, Disney premiered the Genie Plus service in Florida. Some guests were confused as to the difference between the regular lightning lanes and paid lightning lanes. Some guests were upset that they were now paying for access to priority lines when under Fast Pass Plus they used to receive this benefit with park admission. There were some issues with how well Genie used data to suggest activities that fit a guest interest profile. It was clear that the initial system would need to evolve over the coming months to better meet guests' needs. The one somewhat humorous issue that many guests noticed on that first day was that multiple pages on the Genie Plus service ended with a legal disclaimer that still had the lorem ipsum boilerplate language. That is the nonsense language that is used in templates as a placeholder before the final language is inserted as text. But the overall system worked reasonably well especially if you only used its ride reservation system. At least it worked reasonably well with moderate crowds. I used the system on multiple days in November and had very few problems with it in terms of reserving ride times. But then came Thanksgiving week, which for Disney is one of the two busiest periods of the year. What was immediately clear was that there was not enough capacity in Genie Plus to satisfy those guests interested in the Genie Plus experience. Over Thanksgiving weekend, reservation spots for top attractions filled within minutes. Reservation windows opened at 7 a.m. and by 7.05, many rides such as Slinky Dog Dash and Test Track were filled or nearly filled for the entire day. Even those lightning lanes with a per-experience price tag such as Rise of the Resistance were filled within minutes. The primary issue at the Florida Resort was reservation limits within the Genie Plus attractions, as almost certainly a higher percentage of guests at the Florida Resort would like to purchase Genie Plus compared to guests visiting at the California Resort, which hosts a far higher percentage of pass holders and other locals who visit the parks on a somewhat regular basis. This was also a problem for Fast Pass Plus in its early days before it more deeply expanded out reservation windows for character greetings and show seatings. As a simple math problem, there needs to be enough good reservation spots to make visitors feel that Genie Plus is worth its price tag. And by good reservation spots, I mean something with a longer wait time than Philhar Magic or the Laugh Floor. What is a reasonable number of reservation spaces for good attractions? Well, the previous free system offered three, so I'm guessing that four good reservations is probably the point where most guests would feel that this system had value. Again, that's a guess, not a number tied to research. In ways, the problems in Florida should have paved the way for a better opening to the Genie Plus system in California, where the number of available lightning lanes was less likely to be a problem. As a park, 
Disneyland has far more rides and attractions overall to absorb guests than any park in Florida. But the opening of Genie Plus had problems in California as well. The problems here weren't tied to capacity, rather to IT issues, including a rushed rollout directly leading into a busy holiday season for a system that wasn't yet robustly tested. On Monday, December 6th, Disney announced that it would roll out the Genie Plus service at its California resort two days later on December 8th. During the month of December, all reservations for both parks in California had been booked out for weeks. I assumed that the short time between the announcement and the rollout was designed to create a situation in which regular park guests would first try out the Genie Plus service, as opposed to bloggers, vloggers, and reviewers who, if there was more lead time, would have reserved a large swath of reservations to try out the Genie service. From my standpoint, this looked like a reasonable plan. Disney would see how regular guests used the system on the first day, and if there were issues, the park wouldn't be filled with a large number of visitors who were there specifically to try out every function inside of the Genie service. Let me add in one more piece of the puzzle here. December 8th, that Wednesday, was also a media event at Disneyland. ABC would film the holiday parade so footage could be edited into the Christmas Day program. To do this, the park slows down the holiday parade to a near crawl, ensuring that television crews have the ability to capture each unit from multiple angles. If you love the holiday parade so much you'd like to watch it for an hour, the taping event is made especially for you. The parade is typically shifted earlier in the day, usually just after 1 o'clock, when the sun is at an ideal angle to light those floats with some front-facing rays as they move from Small World to Town Square. The camera crews are largely assembled to the right of the castle when the parade makes its turn onto the hub. So if you ever wanted to see yourself in a crowd shot, this would be the perfect place to stand. Also, if you ever wanted some free Disney swag, you should show up early and find a spot alongside the curb opposite the cameras, as Disney cast members, to address the event, tend to hand out holiday ears and necklaces made of holiday lights to both solidify the holiday atmosphere and to softly suggest to home viewers that most everyone who comes to the park now really does buy ears and other items to dress up. But anyway, to get back to our main story. Because of this taping, other media elements were in the park as well. Radio stations, newspapers, and so on. And this, too, I thought was a good sign. One that suggested that Disney was confident that the new Genie system would easily integrate into the Disneyland app, as they wouldn't want groups complaining about tech problems while a media event was happening in the park. I was expecting to have an easy day. I figured that only a small percent of visitors at the park would know about the new Genie service and therefore usage would be minimal and lightning lanes would be very short. None of these things played out as I expected. We arrived at the resort around 8.30, about a half hour after it opened. On the tram path leading to the park entrance were banners advertising the new Genie service, dozens of them arranged in a long row. I saw no one stop to look at them at all. As Genie couldn't be engaged until guests were inside the park, I didn't worry that it wasn't yet showing up as an option on the Disneyland app as we walked toward the turnstiles. I figured the park was geofenced and that the Genie module would populate once I was inside. But when I was inside the park, this didn't happen. A cast member over at Guest Relations told me that I likely needed to update my app, as a new data package had posted to the app over the previous day or two. My initial thought was, this should have been a paper handout given to all guests as they moved through the turnstiles to enter the parks. My second thought was one of confusion. They only had the data update ready a couple of days ago? 
My general understanding was that updates like this were often rolled out a couple of weeks early so they could be downloaded by a wide range of users with the modules in place by the time they were turned on by the developer. But I updated the app and found a new link under the plus menu that took me to the Genie tip board and to a link to purchase the Genie Plus service. But this link produced the load screen that told me the Genie Plus service was, quote, tapping into a phenomenal cosmic power. And then, after a minute or two, took me to another screen that said, quote, something went wrong, please retry again at a later time. Again, I figured this was likely user error. Specifically, I figured that I might need to manually link tickets for my group into Genie, even though I hadn't needed to do any of this in Florida. But when I talked to a guest relations cast member again, I was told that the system was indeed down. A handful of guests who had entered the park right at 8 a.m. were able to purchase Genie Plus and even some paid lightning lanes. And the tech crew was working to fix the problem and hoped to have it available within 30 minutes. With this, we went on a couple of rides and forgot about it. And then, an hour later, tried to tap into the Genie Plus system around 10 a.m. But again, I found the system was offline. By this point, there were cast members stationed around the park to handle problems. More of those blue umbrella stations than on your typical cloudy Wednesday. At this point, I learned two more things. First, those who had purchased Genie Plus at 8 a.m. now needed to walk to a cast member station so the cast member could create a new ride reservation for them. From what I could tell, the wait for these guest relations lines was about 15 minutes. This policy was quickly changed to one where guests could simply show their ticket or email receipt for Genie Plus and be passed on to any regular lightning lane without a time reservation. And lastly, I learned if I was interested in a paid lightning lane, I might be able to simply make a payment at the ride itself and enter the lightning lane. For me, this sounded like a wild workaround. In terms of optics, to manage both the standby line and the lightning lane, Disney would want to visually mitigate the fact that money separates one line from the other. The last thing they would want, I figured, was for one person to hand over a credit card in full view of those in the standby line and then proceed to walk past them. This is why these transactions in most every theme park take place either online or far from the lines themselves. I was curious to see how this was happening, so I walked over to Rise of the Resistance, the only attraction on the Disneyland side of the resort with a paid lightning lane, to see how this on-site sales system was being laid out, only to discover that the ride had gone down and wasn't expected to be back up and running for over an hour. Cast members had already vacated most of the standby line. From here, things that day, at least in terms of Genie Plus, only got worse. Around 11 o'clock, I was told that IT needed to reboot the entire Genie system. This would take roughly two hours. And then later that day, we learned that the hard reset of the Genie system didn't fix the problems. Some of the pages that were reloaded were beta or incomplete pages. At one point, the main Genie page started with a line of bold text that was meant to say $20 per guest but instead said dollar sign per guest, which I'm guessing was an early version of the page before the tech team inserted the final price. Or maybe price was a variable that could easily be changed. By early afternoon, Disney was handing out refunds and complimentary old-style fast pass recovery tickets to those who had purchased the system as an apology for their troubles. And Genie Plus, on its first day in California, was more or less turned off at least until the evening. People focused on other things like the parade that moved with slow, determined steps down Main Street. As far as I was concerned, it was still a good day, only without a working version of Genie Plus. Five days later, Disney sent the following email to those who had purchased Genie Plus on its first day. Dear Disney guest, it began, we apologize for the technology challenges you may have experienced with your Disney Genie Plus purchase during your visit on Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. We are working to provide recovery, and if you have not received assistance, please contact us at guestservices at Disneyland.com. The morning after Genie premiered, much of the system was back online. 
I wasn't visiting that Thursday, December 9th, but I did have a reservation to visit over the weekend. In terms of being able to try out Genie Plus in California, this second visit was a good visit. I arrived at the park mid-morning, though reservations were fully booked out. Disneyland, even on weekends, tends not to be busy in the morning, often not until the evening, until locals arrive after work. So that morning, I wanted to see how many attractions I could experience in two hours, simply moving from one lightning lane to the next. The answer was seven. From headliners like Rise of the Resistance and Pirates and Indiana Jones to moderately popular rides like Autopia and Buzz Lightyear. It was a very smooth morning, an ideal experience. As I mentioned in the intro, I've waited until after the winter holidays to post this episode. I wanted to see in person how the system worked in Florida during the busiest period of the year before discussing its value and exploring how to use the system to your advantage regardless of when you visit a park. I also wanted a firm on the ground understanding of how valuable Genie Plus is in different parks during different crowd levels. Are there parks where Genie Plus is not particularly valuable? And are there parks where Genie Plus will save you time enough to justify its costs? The answers are yes and yes. For me, the takeaway from these early use stories is this. From how these systems were introduced, it's clear that even after the winter holidays, Genie Plus is a work in progress. It will change and evolve as the months progress, hopefully with an eye as to how its tools might better serve guests. As I've mentioned, I've spent time with Genie Plus on both coasts during a range of days, including during the peak winter holiday period in both California and Florida. And in my opinion, there's pros and cons to Genie Plus. To start with, let's lay out the basics. And for some of you, this may be familiar information, but let's get the basics down. And then we'll move on to other things such as what you can do to optimize this new service. Genie is actually an interconnected suite of three services. The system is somewhat convoluted with overlapping names that adds to the confusion. First, there is the Free Genie service, which offers suggestions for attractions with low wait times, along with suggestions for restaurants and other experiences. Disney has very rich data on many of us, from tracking our visits and buying patterns for years. I'm pretty sure they have very rich data on me as my visits are tied to my annual passes and my purchases and meals are tied to annual pass discounts. They know what kind of foods I like and what I don't like based on my ordering history. But this wealth of data doesn't seem to be integrated in any meaningful way into the free genie service. The free genie service for me kept suggesting burger and fries quick service restaurants that are far outside my dining history and more in line with food that teenagers might eat. Disney can easily pull up the history of the meals that I've purchased. I often eat solo at the park so they know what I eat. And it would be easy for them to see that my dining habits for years have trended toward more healthy options than the quick service restaurants that mostly offer burgers and fries. Even if you aren't a pass holder, if you've purchased a ticket or a hotel room with a credit card and then put your name on that ticket or that hotel room and then use that card for other purchases at the resort, they probably have a reasonable amount of information on your shopping and dining preferences as well. I know things like this make people uncomfortable. We are all being tracked by companies through email addresses, browser cookies, credit card numbers, annual pass discounts, and so on. And this is not an argument to legitimize how companies collect data. And it's certainly not an argument that companies should expand consumer tracking. But if the data is already there, maybe there are some more consumer beneficial ways to use it. Yet oddly, this rich area of data is not being leveraged in Genie to suggest experiences, restaurants, and purchases that would align with my previous shopping and dining patterns. With a more robust algorithm, this feature in Genie 
might tell me that some of my regular standbys, such as Katsura Grill in World Showcase or Yak and Yeti at Animal Kingdom, have low wait times. But this feature in the general Genie app, at least so far, isn't working like that. My observations about the free Genie service is that, in its present version, it's mostly designed to better distribute guests throughout the park by suggesting that guests move from attractions in dense areas, such as Fantasyland, to less dense areas, such as Tomorrowland and also by suggesting that guests visit underused restaurants, which are typically counter service options. For the most part, I'd recommend ignoring the options in the free Genie service, as they are more focused on crowd distribution than on ensuring guests have a good time. Most people who listen to this podcast are familiar with how the parks are laid out. And aside from listing current wait times, I'm not sure that, at least for the audience that listens to this podcast, there's going to be much value in the free areas of the Genie service. The second component of the Genie system is the Paid Genie Plus service. This component, for reasons that confound me, has nearly the same name as the free service. Genie Plus is a service that allows guests to bypass the standby line and enter a handful of popular attractions and other experiences with very little weight. This component can be worthwhile, depending on the park you are visiting and the level of crowds on the day you visit. I've tried out Genie Plus in all of the American parks on slow days, moderate days, and busy days. I've never had more than a five-minute wait at any attraction. This service is $15 per day per guest in Florida and $20 per day in California. This service lets you access Genie Plus Lightning Lanes that feed directly into a loading or pre-show area. The final component of the Genie service are individually paid Lightning Lanes. Again, notice the duplication of the name. Only there is a difference between the buffet of Lightning Lane options included in Genie Plus and those that have individual price tags. Each Disney park holds back one or two highly desirable attractions from the Paid Genie Plus system, giving them a per-charge entry. For example, over at Hollywood Studios, though the Lightning Lane for Smuggler's Run is included in the bulk offerings on Genie Plus, the other Star Wars attraction, Rise of the Resistance, is a separate, individually paid Lightning Lane, usually priced at $20 you are able to purchase the Genie Plus package by itself. You are able to purchase up to two individually paid Lightning Lanes by themselves, or you can purchase some combination of both. To understand if Genie Plus is a good value for you and also to understand the problems this new service is trying to solve, you need to first understand a little about the recent history of the Florida Resort. At the Florida Resort three years ago, when you booked a room, you weren't simply booking a room. You were booking a set of services that were bundled in with a room reservation. These included priority access to Fast Pass, the Magical Express bus service from the airport, transportation around Disney World, complimentary magic bands, complimentary parking, additional access to the parks through extra magic hours, and access to the dining plan. Over the past three years, Many of these features were quickly unbundled from room and ticket purchases, and it was done so quickly that it was noticed by regular guests, so much so that it makes it easy to compare rooms on property with those off property now that many of the extras have been removed from a Disney package. Based on listener emails and also conversations with regular guests, I would say that the two largest issues on this list are the removal of the Fast Pass Plus system that was once included with park admission and the complimentary Magical Express bus system that once took guests from the Orlando airport over to Disney hotels. The removal of the Magical Express is particularly confusing for me as it opens the door for guests staying off property or for booking a rental car. 
Last week on our podcast, we talked a lot about the Magical Express, but I bring it up here again as it's part of the overall unbundling of services that once used to be associated with an on-property room reservation at Disney World. As additional services are unbundled from a Disney room reservation, the overall value of that reservation goes down even though the price for the room remains roughly the same. Historically, a moderate room on Disney property, depending on the time of year, was typically priced between $250 and $350 per night. The value of the room by itself in the Central Florida market was probably worth between $150 and $200 per night. That is, if you drove just a mile or two off property, you could easily find a comparable room for significantly less. The remaining value of the Disney Premium was the bundled services, and I'm using the moderate rooms here specifically because they are the most vulnerable to these changes. Deluxe rooms are close to the parks. You can walk from many deluxe rooms to a park. Deluxe rooms also have extended evening hours in the theme parks. Moderate rooms are neither close nor do they have the perk of evening hours. What Disney has done over the previous three years is to unbundle the room packages. Nearly all of these services are still available, but they're available as paid add-ons. Parking is now an add-on. Magic Bands are now an add-on. Magical Express through Mirrors Connect, as we talked about last week, is an add-on. And a type of priority access to quicker lines for popular attractions is also an add-on as well. In this, if you remove the emotional or sentimental value of staying on Disney property and just look at the services, there is an increasing financial advantage to staying off property, especially when considering what Disney calls the moderate hotels. And rather oddly, Genie Plus mostly adds costs to those staying on Disney property without adding significant new benefits, but for those staying off property, it adds costs, but it also adds a meaningful benefit. So what do I mean? Previously, visitors staying on property could book fast passes 60 days before their visit. That is, at least 30 days before everyone else, which routinely booked out the most desirable experiences before those staying off property had an opportunity to pick their fast pass experiences. The removal of the old Fast Pass Plus system with its priority booking window is an advantage for those staying off property. I'd say that rooms at the Hyatt just outside the Disney property line are of comparable quality to moderate rooms on Disney property with a few key differences. Moderate rooms on property are roughly 300 square feet. At the Hyatt, standard rooms are roughly 400 square feet. Also at the Hyatt, those rooms are typically $100 less expensive than most moderate rooms on property. Previously, the only way for a guest to have priority access to fast pass reservations was to stay on property. But now for just $15 a person, the guest at the Hyatt or a Marriott, or for that matter, even the Motel 6, can have nearly the same access to priority ride reservations as those staying on property. For just $15, it's now mostly a level playing field. Everyone staying either on or off property can book priority ride reservations only on the day of their visit. And here's where it gets a wee bit tricky as the bundled pricing at Disney was based per room, not per person. Everyone in your Disney hotel room had priority access to FastPass, whether that was one or five people. So the overall loss of the benefit for those staying on property is based on how many people are staying in your room. If you're now traveling alone, staying on property, the loss of the value to your room is just $15 per night, not much. But if you're a family of five staying on property, the loss to the value of your room is $75 per night, which to me feels substantial. Likewise, here's the mind boggling part of it. If you're a solo traveler staying off property, you can now make up 
one of the most significant differences between off-property and on-property benefits for just $15. And if you're traveling as a couple, you can do the same for $30. To put this another way, assuming those other previous benefits weren't important to you as a couple, you're ahead $70. As with the removal of the Magical Express, there's something about this system in its present incarnation that doesn't make complete financial sense to me. It almost surely means that Disney will need to discount some rooms, like the moderates and the values, to better compete with off-property hotels. Disney has just announced deep discounts to rooms up until summer. But this is far more likely to account for hesitancy with air travel due to COVID. We'll need to wait to post-COVID times to see how some of this unbundling plays out during regular periods in terms of pricing and visitation levels. I don't mean to say that there aren't benefits to the Genie Plus system for those staying on property. There are, and it does solve some previous problems. Genie Plus allows for more spontaneity. Guests no longer need to pick their fast pass reservations two months before they visit. Despite some confusing and duplicated names, it's also an easier system for the infrequent or once-in-a-lifetime visitor to understand. Previously, Fast Pass Plus most benefited those who deeply understood the system and knew when and what to reserve. It most disadvantaged the once-in-a-lifetime visitor who, after showing up at the resort, had no idea that they should have booked Flight of Passage two months ago. There's a learning curve to Genie Plus as well, but I think most once-in-a-lifetime guests will catch on after their first day and mostly get the hang of it by day two. In the previous system, those same visitors to nab highly desirable fast pass reservations on their second day still needed a DeLorean tricked out with a time flux capacitor coupled with a lucky flash of lightning. Beyond these things, as it's a paid service, it will be less used than FastPass Plus was. So if you are using it, you should have less competition for highly desirable attractions than with FastPass Plus. Disney releases information often with marketing aims. According to the fall earnings call, a third of visitors were using Genie Plus when they visited the parks. This means that there is less competition for available spaces in those priority lines. But for me, one of the interesting elements of the release of this particular piece of information was its timing. It was made in a very narrow window after Genie Plus had premiered in Florida and before it was added to the California system. I take this to mean that Disney only wanted to release the Florida numbers, as I'm guessing they believed the California numbers would be lower. I think that's likely true, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. But the paid system, regardless if you're in California or Florida, offers less competition for those priority lines for those using Genie Plus than with the previous system. In all of this, I would say there is a significant benefit to those staying off property as for a nominal charge, it levels out one of the previous differences between on-property and off-property visitors. And for both on-property and off-property guests, it adds spontaneity and allows infrequent visitors to use a system with minimal pre-planning. But there is one more group of guests to consider when examining Genie Plus, and that final group is annual pass holders. In California, most annual pass holders are in-state locals, but there are two main types of pass holders for the Florida parks. Those who frequently travel to the resort, such as DVC members, and those who live in Central Florida. Many pass holders who travel to the resort regularly knew how to use the free FastPass Plus system and how to use it to their benefit, as this new system presently values day-of-use access. Frequent annual pass visitors, such as DVC members, will likely have less of an advantage over typical tourists. And for local pass holders in Florida, the people in this group typically don't visit the parks for a long enough period to make Genie Plus a reasonable purchase. These are the people for which the Genie service is least advantageous. In Florida, the Genie Plus service is $15 for the entire day.
and it makes little sense to purchase it if you are only visiting a park for the evening, particularly if you visit a park once a week. The Genie service for 52 days, that is one day a week for the entire year, would cost nearly $800. So for local pass holders in Florida, the paid Genie Plus system has replaced a service that was once included with the cost of the pass and probably won't be used deeply by most in this category. Or to put this another way, in Florida, the Genie Plus service almost wholly benefits traditional tourists and oddly those choosing to stay at an off-property room while disadvantaging local pass holders, particularly those who visit the parks for short periods of time. This is also true in California. Genie Plus makes little sense to purchase if you're an annual pass holder visiting the parks for an evening or part of the day on a weekend. And this, in part, is the justification for the third part of the Genie system, those individually paid lightning lanes. At each Disney park in Florida and California, most of the old Fast Pass rides are now arranged into either the $15 or $20 a day Genie Plus service. However, each park holds back one or two, top shelf experiences as individually paid lightning lanes. Rise of the Resistance, both in California and Florida, is an individually paid lightning lane. It is not included with the Genie Plus experience at Disneyland and not included with the Genie Plus experience at Hollywood Studios in Florida. Instead, for a fee, which is usually $20, a guest can bypass the standby line and enter the ride pre-show area directly. Rise of the Resistance typically has the longest line at both Disneyland and Hollywood Studios. The $20 is not to experience the ride. You can do that at either park by using the standby line with typically an hour or an hour and a half wait, but the fee is rather to bypass the standby line. This is first a way to sell quick access to peak experiences for traditional tourists. If a tourist on a three-day vacation at Disney World wants to experience as much as they can during their stay, $20 to bypass the line for a rise of the resistance may be a good purchase as that allows them to experience more of the resort. Likewise, though annual pass holders may not be particularly interested in the standard Genie Plus service as they aren't in the park long enough to make good use of it, they may be interested in purchasing one or two lightning lanes. $20 for a Rise of the Resistance is typically the high end for these experiences. Other attractions, at least so far, have something similar to surge pricing. They are more expensive during peak visitation times such as the week after Christmas. But the fee to bypass the line at other paid lightning lane attractions such as Radiator Springs Racers or the Seven Dwarves Mine Train can be as little as $7. This might be more appealing for annual pass holders in a park for a short visit. In this, the Fast Pass replacement is a tiered system that targets multiple audiences with multiple paid products. And now for the big question. Do you need it? And if so, how can you best use it? One of the first decisions you'll need to make is this. Are you interested in individually paid lightning lanes? I'd say that these lightning lanes are most advantageous for traditional tourists with limited time in the parks. For some families, it will make sense to pay for individual lightning lanes so they can use the save time exploring other experiences in the parks. In Florida, the two individual lightning lanes that sell out the fastest are Rise of the Resistance and Flight of Passage. These can sell out early in the morning during busy days. The next two are Seven Dwarves Mine Train and Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. In California, the only paid lightning lane that draws considerable interest is Rise of the Resistance. I've used the paid lightning lanes each time I've passed directly into the pre-show area or load area with little weight. In general, they are well arranged. But fees from paid lightning lanes can quickly add considerable expense to a vacation. The cost of the Rise of the Resistance Lightning Lane is roughly the same cost for a modest lunch at the park. 
For families, the standby line at a theme park can also be a place to talk and also a place to play phone-based games together, such as Heads Up. If you haven't seen Heads Up, it's an ideal phone-based game for families to play in line. There are even Disney-themed editions. If you're not using individually paid lightning lanes, a good park strategy would be to arrive when the park opens and walk as quickly as you can directly to one of the lines with a paid lightning lane. The general Genie Plus package can also be a reasonable purchase for guests planning to spend the entire day at certain parks and under certain conditions. Genie Plus is a system where you pay to bypass the standby line. In considering its value, you should probably know that the posted standby wait times are typically longer than the actual wait times. On a recent visit to the Magic Kingdom, I kept track of the posted wait times and the actual wait times for multiple attractions on multiple days. I also went through both the lightning lanes and the standby line. Pirates of the Caribbean had a posted wait time of 30 minutes for the standby line, but the actual wait time was 18. Space Mountain had a posted wait time of 30 minutes, but the actual wait time was around 16. Tomorrowland Speedway had a posted wait time of around 30 minutes, but the actual wait time was around 22, and so on. I know this feels a little as though Disney is manipulating the posted wait times to make Genie Plus appear more valuable, but the wait times have been historically inflated. It allows for minor problems. If a guest sees a 30-minute posted wait time and then waits 15 minutes, they feel like they've received a bargain. If a guest sees a 30-minute posted wait time, which is really for a 15-minute line, and then there's a minor issue with the attraction that causes a 15-minute delay, guests are still fine as the actual wait time matches the posted wait time. The problems come when the actual wait time is longer than the posted wait time. Disney tries to avoid this by buffering posted numbers. A good rule of thumb is that typically the actual wait time is about 70% of the posted wait time. And here's another good rule of thumb. If you're visiting a park with modest crowds and if you're using Genie Plus throughout the day, you will save about three hours of wait time in line overall. I've added up the minutes saved on a typical day at the Magic Kingdom. It's around three hours. The cost for the service, then, is about $5 per hour saved per person. In California, there are far more Genie Plus Lightning Lanes at Disneyland than at DCA. Because of this, Disneyland is a better value for Genie Plus simply because there's a lot more to do. In Florida, the Magic Kingdom offers the best value for Genie Plus as it has the most lightning lanes. Second on the list in terms of value would be Hollywood Studios. If you're visiting the Florida resort during a period of modest crowds, you might not find deep value in purchasing Genie Plus at Epcot or Animal Kingdom because of the limited number of experiences. If you have a park hopper ticket, this probably is not a concern as the Genie Plus service will follow you as you move from park to park. The purchase price for Genie Plus includes all the parks you visit on that day but more on the value in each park in a moment. One of the keys to maximizing the system is to time your reservations. Reservation windows open each day at 7 a.m. Ideally, you'll log onto the app at 6.55 to purchase Genie Plus and place your first reservation at 7 a.m. Your first reservation should be for one of the park's most popular rides, such as Big Thunder, Test Track, Smuggler's Run, and so on. And don't worry too much if your reservation time is in the middle of the day. You can book your next experience either after you've checked into your first experience or two hours after the park opens, whichever comes first. Let me emphasize this, as this will be important later you can book another lightning lane either immediately after checking into your next experience or with a two-hour rotating window. So if you booked a popular ride such as Kilimanjaro Safari at Animal Kingdom for noon as your first selection, you can book a second selection two hours 
after the park opens. If Animal Kingdom opens at 8 o'clock, this means at 10 o'clock you can book a second attraction. Two hours after a park opens is another important time to monitor when using Genie Plus, especially if the park is crowded, because thousands of other visitors will be waiting for the first two-hour mark to book a second attraction. Reservations for popular attractions will fill up quickly. Again, using the example from Animal Kingdom, during one recent holiday period at 9.59 a.m., the next available reservation time at Navi River Journey was at 2 p.m. By 10.05, all reservation spots were filled until 4 p.m. If you do visit during holiday or weekend periods, you will find that time is a currency in Genie Plus. In the Magic Kingdom, time slots for a few popular rides, such as Big Thunder Mountain, Haunted Mansion, and Peter Pan Flight, will fill faster than other attractions. So you will often be presented with the question, would you like to ride the Haunted Mansion four hours from now and also be blocked out from requesting a new Lightning Lane for two hours? Or would you like to ride Dumbo in 10 minutes and select another Lightning Lane attraction the moment after you step into the ride? In terms of a day strategy, this would be my suggestion for using Genie Plus during a typical visit at a modestly crowded park. Your first Genie Plus selection should be a popular attraction that typically has a long standby wait time. You should arrive at the park when it opens and walk quickly to another popular attraction, saving your Genie Plus attraction for slightly later in the day. If you aren't purchasing the individually paid Lightning Lanes, the first attraction you walk to should probably be one of the attractions with a paid Lightning Lane, as the standby wait times here will be shortest right when the park opens. But after that, there are two reasonable paths, particularly at the Magic Kingdom. You can continue to use Genie Plus reservations to bypass the standby lines at popular attractions. This means you'll have fewer selections over the course of a day. Likely you'll have one selection every two hours, but you'll bypass the longest lines. Or you can select modest attractions, such as the teacups and Dumbo, and bypass a standby line every half hour or so until you run out of selections. Again, you can pick a new attraction on Genie Plus every two hours, which may allow multiple reservation times to pile up later in the day, or you can pick another attraction the moment after you check into your next experience. Again, the strategy of picking modest attractions works best at the Magic Kingdom, where there is a wide selection of Genie Plus attractions. It works reasonably well at Epcot, but is less suited for Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom. The one time the strategy of picking many modest attractions may not be advantageous is during peak holiday periods. This includes the week before and after Christmas, July 4th, and the three days following Thanksgiving. During this period, you may find that the lead time between making a Genie Plus reservation and your arrival window at most attractions is more than two hours. For example, if at noon you're booking a reservation for a 3 p.m. experience on a modestly popular attraction such as Dumbo, you've lost any advantage of booking a modest attraction as you'll be able to book a new experience at 2 p.m. regardless if you've checked into your next attraction or not. So in this situation, you would be better off reserving a more popular attraction, such as Haunted Mansion, even if the reservation arrival time is later in the day, as you can still book another attraction at 2 p.m. Again, from monitoring Genie Plus on many days, this situation so far has been rare and has been relegated to only a few high-capacity days. Along with this, live theater shows, unless you want to sit up front, are almost always a poor use of Genie Plus.
Even popular theater shows such as the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular rarely fill to capacity. You should be able to arrive 10 to 15 minutes before the show starts and find a seat. The same principle applies to movie-based attractions such as Muppet Vision, Mickey's Philhar Magic, and the Disney and Pixar Short Film Festival at Epcot. These two rarely have much of a wait, if any at all. These options are likely included in Genie Plus to increase capacity so that, even on busy days, there are still options for guests to select. If you're visiting the Magic Kingdom, the five Genie Plus attractions you most want to target in terms of decreasing your wait time are these. Peter Pan Flight, Haunted Mansion, Big Thunder, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Splash Mountain. The two paid lightning lanes at Magic Kingdom are Seven Dwarves Mine Train and Space Mountain, though if you're visiting during a peak holiday period, Disney may move Space Mountain over to the roster of general attractions on the Genie Plus list to create more reservation capacity for Genie Plus users. If you arrive at the park at opening, a good strategy would be to pick one of these five rides as your first lightning lane and then while waiting for your reservation time to open, walk to one of the two paid lightning lane attractions and wait in the standby line, which should be short just after rope drop. I won't recommend a particular ride to Target as your first lightning lane selection, as there's a big difference between those visitors who are most interested in Peter Pan Flight and those most interested in Big Thunder. But Peter Pan Flight will most likely save you the most in terms of wait time. Genie Plus, in my opinion, can be a good value at the Magic Kingdom, even during modestly busy days. At Hollywood Studios, the five Genie Plus attractions to target are Slinky Dog Dash, Tower of Terror, Rock and Roller Coaster, Toy Story Mania, and Smuggler's Run. The two paid lightning lanes are Rise of the Resistance and Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, though if you visit during a peak holiday period, Disney may move Runaway Railway over to the roster of general Genie Plus attractions. The first attraction to target at this park would be Slinky Dog Dash, as reservations for this ride tend to book out more quickly than any other in the park. Genie Plus is less valuable at Hollywood Studios than at the Magic Kingdom, though still can be a good value on even modestly busy days. At Animal Kingdom, there are not five attractions to target. They have three to target, Kilimanjaro Safaris, Navi River Journey, and Dinosaur. Most of the other general lightning lane experiences are easy to acquire throughout the day. The two individually paid lightning lane experiences at this park are Flight of Passage and Expedition Everest. Though if you visit during a peak holiday period, Disney may move Expedition Everest over onto the roster of general Genie Plus attractions. Expedition Everest also has a single rider line, which is typically 10 minutes long. In terms of Genie Plus's value, Animal Kingdom is a difficult call. If you're visiting during a particularly busy period, such as over Thanksgiving or the winter holidays, Genie Plus will likely justify its cost. I recently visited Animal Kingdom during Christmas week. I found that Genie Plus allowed me to access four key rides, which were Kilimanjaro Safari, Navi River Journey, Dinosaur, and Expedition Everest, over an eight-hour period with very little wait times. But during non-peak periods, most of these attractions, except for Kilimanjaro Safaris, have relatively short wait times. If you were to purchase Genie Plus at this park, Kilimanjaro Safaris would be the ride to target as your first lightning lane selection. At Epcot, there are also less than five attractions to target. The two to target are Test Track and Soren. 
the two paid lightning lanes are Ratatouille and Frozen Ever After, though if you visit during the peak holiday period, Disney may move Frozen over to the roster of general Genie Plus attractions. Again, there may not be a great value to purchasing Genie Plus at this park, as the two most desirable rides in the park are part of the paid lightning lane options, not the Genie Plus service. But if you were to purchase Genie Plus at Epcot, Test Track would be the one to book first. One experience not presently on Genie Plus at Epcot is reserved viewing for Harmonious. Harmonious has, unfortunately, only one truly ideal location, where the various floating platforms align to create seamless images across multiple screens. This is directly at the entrance to World Showcase. If reserved viewing was a Genie Plus option from this location, that would increase the value of the service significantly at this park. In California, at Disneyland, the five Genie Plus attractions to target are Space Mountain, Indiana Jones Adventure, Matterhorn Bobsleds, Smuggler's Run, and The Haunted Mansion. If it's a warm day, swap out Splash Mountain for Smuggler's Run or Haunted Mansion. Disneyland only has one paid lightning lane, which is Rise of the Resistance. If you're spending a full day at Disneyland, Genie Plus is a good value even on modestly busy days. Across the way at DCA, the four attractions to target are Soren. Mission Breakout, The Incredicoaster, and Midway Mania. If it's warm, add in Grizzly River Run. The two individually paid lightning lanes are Web Slingers and Radiator Springs Racers. Radiator Springs Racers also has a single rider line, which is rarely longer than 15 minutes. Genie Plus, due to a lower selection of attractions, holds less value at DCA than at Disneyland. There are a couple of more useful things to know about Genie Plus. Genie Plus is a dynamic system. Reservation spots refill during the day even for attractions that were previously booked solid until park closing. There are likely a number of reasons for this. The first has to do with cancellations. When guests cancel a ride reservation, likely to book a different experience, those reservations are immediately added back into inventory. So, if at noon you're looking for a Big Thunder reservation and seeing available times only around 4 p.m., if you repeatedly refresh the Genie Plus screen, you may find an earlier reservation spot added back into inventory, perhaps for 1 p.m. or 2. If you find one, grab it as these quickly fill. Second, there seems to be sets of reservation spots that are held back at park opening and then added later in the day. My guess is that this is related to three likely factors. First, some reservations are likely withheld in case an attraction experiences downtime. As the day moves on, if the attraction has no downtime, those can be added back into inventory. Second, there may simply be some reservations set aside for guests who purchased Genie Plus after entering a park at 10 or 11 a.m. There's little incentive to purchase Genie Plus once you are in the park if all of the good reservations are taken for the rest of the day. And lastly, on peak days, Disney may shift some standby spots over to Genie Plus if crowds in the park are larger than anticipated. Again, Genie Plus needs to have some type of availability all day long, otherwise guests will complain. So the takeaway here is that Genie Plus will add times and capacity throughout the day. There's no set time for these reservation dumps. The reason? So that people with a little knowledge, like you and me, can't game the system.
It's also important to know that during peak holiday periods, Genie Plus still doesn't have enough capacity. If you visit during a non-holiday period, you'll likely find that you can make Genie Plus selections from morning at least until late afternoon, maybe longer. As I write this, industrial engineers are still experimenting with ways to create more capacity within the system during busy days. Part of this includes shows and parades. When the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular reopened on December 19th, early access to seating was an option for Genie Plus reservations. Except for that very first show, the first show to be performed in over 600 days, most anyone could have found a seat by arriving 10 or so minutes before the show's start time. I was there that day and watched this play out. But to create capacity, seating was added to the options in Genie Plus. Likewise, when the daytime holiday parade returned to the Magic Kingdom on December 22nd, Disney offered a preferred viewing location as a Genie Plus option. And this was the source of another programming glitch. The system offered too many reservations for the roped off viewing location and then removed excess reservations without alerting those who held the reservations that they no longer had a viewing spot for the parade. In other words, the concepts in this guide will give you a good basis for navigating Genie Plus, but also realize that especially during its first year, Disney will expand, change, and alter the service until it finds ways to balance capacity with demand, particularly during holiday periods. So hopefully, with some of this information, you are now all set to have a fabulous day the next time you visit the parks. I'll be back next Sunday with a new episode. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. Without subscribers, we would simply cease to exist. If you enjoy these episodes, if you find them useful or helpful, please support us by becoming a monthly subscriber over on Bandcamp. On Bandcamp, you will find dozens and dozens of extra episodes. But the best reason to subscribe is to simply make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link over in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.